Welcome to today's webinar, Current Landscape of Respiratory Illnesses and the Role of Multiplex Target Testing. I'm Cassie Saltman of LabRoots and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is presented by LabRoots and brought to you by Abbott. To learn more, visit www.abbott.com. We encourage you to participate today by submitting any questions you may have during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box to the left and click Submit. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentations. You may also use the Ask a Question box to let us know if you're having any trouble seeing or hearing the presentation. I'd like to now welcome our speakers for today's webinar. Dr. Cameron Wolf, Associate Professor of Medicine, Department of Medicine, Division of Infectious Diseases at Duke University Medical Center, and Dr. Stephen Riedel, Associate Medical Director, Clinical Microbiology Laboratories at Beth, Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center and Associate Professor of Pathology at Harvard Medical School. For a complete biography on our speakers, please visit the biography tab on the top of your screen. Dr. Wolf, you may now begin your portion of the presentation. Hi, thanks for the introduction. My, my name is Cameron Wolf. I'm a professor of medicine in the Infectious Diseases Division at Duke University. And today I'm going to be chatting to you about uh, respiratory viral diseases, in particular focusing in on uh, some of those common illnesses that we run into quite frequently, flu, RSV, and, and more recently COVID. And I'm going to try and walk through not only some clinical presentations, but also to start thinking about some details of what we might expect in the upcoming months. So here are my disclosures. Um, you can see here I have had some uh, Drug Safety Monitoring Board and Advisory Board work in the viral uh, space. Um, this is not related to my talk today. And whilst I am a member of both uh, um, Influenza and COVID Guidelines Committees, um, this talk is not sort of, I, I don't speak on behalf of those groups here uh, by any means. So my outline of what I want to cover today really goes through, as I said, some of the clinical details. I'm going to try and tease apart how uh, clinicians may view differences where they exist in flu, RSV, and COVID. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the timing of diagnostics, some treatment options that exist for at least a few of these viruses, and then some uh, good news, at least in terms of vaccine options, which uh, are now coming down the pike. Um, I'm then going to turn to my crystal ball and try and do a little bit of predictive work and, and hopefully uh, give you some indications as to what we might expect for the upcoming respiratory viral season. So it's probably best to start with influenza because I think this does um, sort of mark our most traditional of all respiratory viruses that we see. And it's certainly the one that historically, certainly pre-COVID, was the one with the best data feeds from which to learn from. So what we see here is some CDC data that looks at the seasonality of this in the Northern Hemisphere, in particular the United States. And the message I want people to really understand is, like you would all know, this really tends to be um, both a winter virus in the absence of a pandemic strain, but one that typically would turn up uh, usually around de late December, early January, um, occasionally persist through until sort of the end of February or sometimes into March, as you can see there from the grey line in 2018. But the cadence of this virus is very classically uniform each year. We typically would see very little in October, November. It becomes the months where we want to vaccinate people ahead of its arrival, typically in late December, and then we, uh, then we see it last for a couple of months. That is exactly the same um, overlay for RSV, typically. Um, we would usually see it occurring almost exactly the same pace. We're learning about what COVID can do. It does tend to have a winter peak, but as many of you may know, there's also been now repeatedly for four years a little late summer spike of COVID-2, so it may prove to actually be a biannual virus. When we look at what's happened in recent years, actually the graphs look a little different, so apologies here that the axis has moved slightly, but what you can see with the little red triangles is last year's flu season and that it was transposed by a, a couple of months, in fact, arriving quite early. This, uh, this was also seen for RSV, uh, and I think is largely the confluence of a few things coming out of the um, pandemic for sure, um, and then also the sort of the dropping of some of our typical mitigation factors that might have taken place. 
So it's uh, it, one has a little bit of trouble predicting what COVID will continue to do for other respiratory viruses in the in the upcoming winter season. But I do think if you compare um, certainly the pink and orange lines here, which represent um, our sort of flu seasons during the pandemic, the red, the last year's flu season, certainly from a volume, was much more um, a, a typical year. It just arrived uh, earlier than what we anticipated. And there's a good healthy reminder that that can happen. Uh, and our vaccine strategies to try and get people protected in sort of the September, October phase um, are really designed to try and counter that sort of potential early season. Typically, you can also subdivide influenza a little bit further into thinking about flu A and flu B. And whilst clinically they can be a little harder to tease apart, influenza B does typically appear a little bit later. It's usually not um, the same burden of illness in terms of number of cases. It does have a slightly different preponderance, um, causing a little more trouble in older adults and sometimes waves in pediatric cases tends to be a slightly milder illness, less hospitalizations due to flu B, but it tends to be a slightly different uh, arrival as well. So when we think of how this in recent years has sort of transpired to other, um, all, all of those viruses at once, you know, last year was a busy year. And I think it behooves us to then sort of think about that moving forward as to what might come to pass in the year to come. So 2022 and 2023, the highest weekly rate of RSV uh, that we'd seen certainly throughout the pandemic and for a couple of years before. Um, that was true also for influenza. Again, an early season compared to what we thought for RSV as well. And then when we think of um, sort of when this impacted our hospitals, it really did for each of these viruses that you see here on the screen. Combined um, is the orange that you see at the top, but really there was, a, there was an early pre-Christmas um, spike for RSV and flu a little bit of a uh, later in the winter spike of COVID, but all of these sort of compounded on on top of each other at the same time. And I don't see any reason why that would not be the same case this year coming. So can we tell them apart? And I, I think this, the overall summary is it is very difficult when you sit in front of a patient in a clinic or in an urgent care uh, to, to really tease these three illnesses apart. For the most part, Patients will have mild illness, but each one of these can certainly cause viral pneumonia. And as we've seen from COVID, a really unique hyperinflammatory syndrome there. There are a couple of things that are quite unique. You know, flu really stereotypically is abrupt. Um, you know, people can often pin down the hour when they suddenly noticed, you know, high fevers, severe muscle aches and pains, much more so than other respiratory viruses. It is a systemic illness. Um, and it's sort of an early and very prominent fatigue, uh, which, which predominates. Most people can sort of remember that bad episode of influenza. RSV, you know, a little more of a head cold, I think, to generalise. Um, much more sort of sinus, um, sore throat, stuffiness and, and persistent cough. Um, much less common in older adults to cause the sort of the systemic features that are notable with flu and sometimes COVID. Of course, RSV has its own unique issues in young children, particularly less than one, um, whose lung architecture is not as, as structured to handle that virus yet, more so than perhaps the other two listed here. And then COVID, um, COVID these days, fortunately, a much more mild illness than what we saw in 2020 and 2021 for most people. Um, sometimes a systemic thing. The interesting thing that we would all remember is that sort of sudden and abrupt loss of smell and taste as it, as it had uh, inflammatory elements to it, which reassuringly we see less of these days. So the other part of a message that I always like to try and tell patients is that, you know, influenza and I would add COVID and sometimes RSV to this list, have other features that are not just respiratory. So, you know, it's widely recognised in the general community that the symptoms you see here on the left, cough, uh, runny nose, fevers, headaches, myalgias, um, are, are very common and ubiquitous amongst many respiratory viruses. But it's the other processes that we are only beginning to understand. As we have better testing, we realise that there are a number of neurologic features that can be triggered by the presence of influenza. You see some of them here. We certainly, each year, coinciding with the peaks of flu, see exacerbations in patients who have pneumonia, bacterial pneumonia, um, inflammatory conditions of the heart, uh, 
ischemic disease of the heart where perhaps the influenza was relatively mild but triggered their at-risk heart attack to occur. And we see this um, uh, as, a, as a sort of a peak, unfortunately, in mortality due to flu. And then it has meaningful issues amongst pregnant women. So we see increased fetal loss, maternal mortality, and small uh, babies born small for size. This, I think, is less understood, frankly, in the, in the general community, and yet leaves a very large part of flu's overall morbidity. Typical time courses would be familiar to most of you who've come through a bad episode of flu. You know, this can be persistent, whereas most common colds would be 24 to 48 hour illnesses. There's many people who would say, look, hey, I, I, was, uh, I was pretty prominently unwell for a good three to four to five days. Um, again, sort of abrupt onset of illness and fever in, those, in that first sort of 24 hours um, being a, a real hallmark. What you can see at the bottom, I think, is important, and that's... Uh, characterization of the quantity of virus that one sheds and it does fairly similarly match the, the 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 strength of one's symptoms but you can see on day zero already quite a large amount of virus gets shed before people become symptomatic and that's sort of a telltale sign that in fact patients can be infectious before they recognize that they have uh, active symptoms we know that there's a burden of disease here um, and that this is more than, than perhaps what gets recognised. So methodologically, this has been looked at in the past, certainly pre-COVID, looking at hospitalisations, outpatient visits, and then at the end of the day, like I said earlier, how many excess pneumonia and circulatory deaths take place in different age groups during the peak of flu season. As you can see here, you know, particularly in older adults over the age of 65, we have in the order of many thousands of excess deaths due to flu each year. And yet it doesn't really rise to the level of individual consciousness, I think, as much as it should. But this is an issue for our older adults, for sure. It can, you know, you, you can put it in a different way. This was within the first month of, of having our bad COVID early burst last year. Remember, this caught us off guard. A lot of people probably hadn't been vaccinated by early October. And yet, even within that month, it was now estimated that we probably had, uh, you know, two to 3,000 extra deaths due to flu. And that absolutely caught our attention when that was due to COVID. And yet, sort of flu has somehow been normalized into us thinking that that is an expected and acceptable outcome. And I would challenge you that it really isn't. When we think about virus and we think about symptoms for flu, um, like I said, virus is there early. So day one, you can see here on the left, the black, the black circles represent the amount of virus. It's early and it's prominent and it's, it's ahead of your symptoms. You're infectious as soon as you know you might be sick, probably a couple of days early. So when, but I'm going to draw an arbitrary line here at day four because by the time most people get symptoms and get tested and reach their physician, this may be the time that it takes. They're just starting to feel well, and yet already the peak of their virus was considerably earlier than that it does become harder to test and harder to find flu <clears throat> the longer you've left it. So if you want to find an intervention point for patients who you suspicious might have flu, it's the right season, perhaps they've had that abrupt fever and myalgia, um, you really want to get them their tests as soon as possible to have the biggest, uh, the, the, the biggest ability to intervene. And I know my colleagues will talk a little bit more about testing in a minute. So... Earlier treatment we know leads to earlier recovery for flu. There's plenty of good data both in the outpatient world for oseltamivir and now uh, a new drug, um, baloxivir. Um, certainly has greater advantages if patients can get their symptoms treated, particularly within the first two days. That is actually true from a survival point of view. That is true in pregnant women, particularly patients who've landed in the hospital. And it's true that even beyond 48 hours, and this is where I think we sometimes forget as well, beyond 48 hours, if you've been sick enough to land in the hospital, there is actually benefit statistically for antivirals. So again, earlier diagnosis helps you make that sort of uh, that clinical judgment. 48 hours as an, as an outpatient and really whatever time you get sick enough to land in the hospital. Um, we have differences now in vaccination that are worth talking about when it comes to flu. The first is a distinct preference for older adults to get 
more aggressive with the way we vaccinate them. We know as you get older, your body becomes what we call immunosenescent. You lose the ability to mount as strong and as durable response. So what's the right answer to that? The answer is, in fact, to give you a little more of a challenge up front. There's now three vaccines available that you see here that are largely classified as, as equivalent in terms of the way that they will help uh, older adults, and I would argue immunosuppressed adults as well, to make a good durable defence. Um, that is uh, true and helpful, particularly in older adults that you see here in red. In prior years, some of the responses that over 65-year-old um, adults have had to their flu vaccine have been really poor. So if you look on the left of this table, you see the overall vaccine efficacy, the proportion of flu cases prevented in vaccinated adults usually goes about 40 to 50 percent. Over 65, sometimes we're less than a quarter. Um, so there's, there's been this need, because you remember they're the people who get the most ill. There's been this need for absolutely better protection. We now understand that better. We now understand that should be higher dosed um, vaccines for our older adults. Treatment, like I said, is actually pretty straightforward. We have both Tamiflu and Biloxivir. These are widely available and largely should be classified as equal. One's a five-day course, a more traditional Tamiflu drug. Um, Biloxivir, quite an easy once a day, one, one pill once and, and you're covered. Both work in post-exposure situations. Um, really, Tamiflu is the drug of choice for hospitalised patients um, or in pregnancy. I'm going to flip now and move to RSV. Most people in the general community think of RSV as a, as a, you know, that other flu that always circulates around the same time. It has meaningful morbidity and mortality, again, that I think is under-recognised. So you can see here some statistics based out of, again, this comes out of, sort of CDC data, um, looking at the cost burden and health burden. Again, an illness that for us last year appeared earlier. We can now pick that up on some of our wastewater testing that COVID led us to have. RSV, sadly, however, from a treatment point of view, uh, whilst there are drugs that are in the pipeline, none of them um, have made it to the front line. So this is an issue for patients where prevention is absolutely better than uh, stumbling through the illness. Mainly, it's a problem for neonates, like I said. So babies less than one, particularly, but also up to sort of two, really don't have a good natural architectural defence against RSV. They gain some defence from breast milk, but they are the people who we would think are the classically the highest risk. And yet, even then, most of the mortality actually occurs in people over the age of 65. It's just we don't think about it in that context. We have some drugs now for, for our youngest of individuals, there's a preventative antibody that helps babies who may not have had a chance to develop immunity yet. Um, this is going to be the first season when that's actually available and it's going to be sort of, I think, particularly helpful for hospitalised sick infants where, you know, the last thing you want is to add RSV to whatever else they're, they're finding. What about COVID? I'm glad this is sort of becoming the afterthought of my discussions to some extent, but not completely yet. You can see that we're in the midst of a little summer peak. And I think if you look at these incident curves of hospitalization in the US, you can see that pretty consistently there's been a little summer blip. Um, that's probably a convergence both of our uh, letting our guard down and socializing much more in the aftermath of summer holidays, but may also be a, a natural viral phenomenon. We have seen a steady ongoing drift of variants. That's expected. That's what we what a virus will do. It will evolve to match our changing immunity. The most current one being um, a variant called EG5. This is an Omicron derivative. It's drifted a long way from what our original vaccines were protective against. And so no longer does your vaccine a year or two ago or your COVID illness a year or two ago offer you quite the same protection as it used to. We still see people who have long COVID. Um, you know, COVID may not be front page because of the mortality, but it's sure causing uh, a lot of patients an illness still. This is the, the syndrome of really persistent neurological and, and sort of cardiophysiological syndromes that some patients uh, sort of inexplicitly get. It's very hard to predict, other than to say it seems less common in individuals who've been vaccinated, a little less common as we move through variants, thankfully, but it still occurs a good reason not to want to be flippant about COVID. Uh, 
We have treatments, fortunately, you know, both the, the three drugs that I list here on the board, both oral Paxlovid and Molnupiravir and injectable remdesivir, uh, well studied now, widely available, thankfully. Um, and whilst there's pros and cons of each one, I think clinicians and their patients should be reassured that we have many more options, thankfully, than we did uh, a couple of years ago. So let's talk about prevention, closing the loop here. We now have vaccines for all of these three viruses. This will be the first year when RSV vaccines have joined the, joined the mix. And two vaccines on the market now, both studied in patients over the age of 60. That's who it's been licensed for. Um, with some really good data, I think, in terms of protective efficacy. So you're sort of reducing uh, four-fifths of all cases of RSV in an immunocompetent group of individuals, that's, that's, a, that's a telling piece of data there. Um, COVID, we expect a modified vaccine, a monovalent vaccine against the XBB Omicron variant coming uh, in late September, early October, and actually not much changed in terms of our flu vaccines this year. But so if you're someone over the age of 60, or particularly those who may have cardiopulmonary disease and be at high risk, um, each of these three vaccines, I think, should be on your radar. We know data to combine flu and COVID that works quite well. There is a trial already that shows that the combination of COVID and RS, sorry, flu and RSV works well. I'm taking the decision to probably not give my patients all three at once, um, but certainly sort of stagger them otherwise. You know, the RSV vaccines actually target a little surface protein. This is uh, a new sort of strategy for us. And, and I think we, we, we really have some good optimism here that they will make a dent in, uh, in that disease. What are some lessons? So we care about vaccine causing breakthroughs, but we also care about severity. And I think this message got a bit lost. First of all, any vaccine, flu vaccines, COVID vaccines, RSV vaccines, not 100% protective. We know that that's okay because what you see here on the right with COVID is that they had a massive impact on mortality. So even if you still get an illness, a breakthrough event, your chance of that being severe has nosedived. And that is true for COVID, true for flu, and likely true for RSV, that data pending. So where are we headed as a final piece? So certainly, thankfully, markedly less hospitalization and mortality due to COVID, but it remains here. I think we have better testing. There's more available. We're certainly more uh, liberally able to get treatment options to those that need, but we should be expecting that variants continue to drift forth and modified vaccines, I think, will be in the near future for, for at-risk patients for sure. Um, I suspect now coming out of the pandemic a little further that we're going to revert much more to a typical winter season in the sort of December, January, February arrival of respiratory viruses. I, I stand to be proven wrong, I guess. And so memory uh, worth knowing September, October, good vaccine season for all of these three. And then finally, I, I'd end with a bottom bullet point here. Um, maybe if the pandemic has taught us anything, a really good opportunity for all of us to probably just be a little bit more respectful of our respiratory hygiene in general. Mask where we need to, doesn't have to be all the time. Many of us now sit in situations where we have flexible employment tolerability. If you're sick, you're allowed to stay home, it's okay. These were probably things we should have been doing pre-pandemic anyway. We now have a little more flexibility. So with that, I'm going to uh, say thank you, and I'm going to hand over to my colleague, uh, Dr. Rydell, to talk a little bit more about some of the lab details. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wolf. Now that we heard about the clinical perspective for viral respiratory illnesses, it is my pleasure to present on aspects of laboratory testing. Please note my various disclosures pertaining to today's presentation. I'd like to particularly point out that this program is sponsored by Abbott and I'm speaking on behalf uh, uh, to you today. Um, <clears throat> so the objectives for my portion of today's presentation are the following. I will just briefly recap some of the important aspects of the epidemiology of viral respiratory infections, specifically focusing on COVID-19, influenza, and RSV. I will then review the approach to laboratory testing uh, for these three illnesses and thereby consider the experiences from the recent pandemic. 
And lastly, I will compare different clinical settings and discuss the utility of various types of testing platforms in those specific healthcare settings. <clears throat> so the three big drivers of upper respiratory tract infections uh, in the next years will likely be SARS-CoV-2, influenza, and RSV. The prevalence of various subtypes or variants of SARS-CoV-2 was previously addressed by Dr. Wolf, and I will not spend time addressing the importance of testing for SARS-CoV-2 variants here. However, it is important to recall that there are various other viral as well as bacterial pathogens that are causes of upper respiratory infections. Some of these pathogens may be associated with significant morbidity for some patients or in specific healthcare settings. The data from the CDC for the last so-called flu season are shown here in the center image. The last season presented with a significant increase in influenza and RSV infections after we had primarily dealt with COVID-19 during the immediate prior years. So the question is now, what is going to be in store for this upcoming winter? First, I'd like to remind everyone that influenza actually did not really disappear during the COVID pandemic. As we heard, the initial perceived disappearance of influenza was in fact an extreme reduction of circulating virus in the community. This phenomenon was at large due to the use of non-pharmaceutical interventions and the stay-at-home orders and closures of schools, universities, and other places of public interaction during the initial months of the pandemic. However, looking at the epidemiologic data in review now, it is clear that some viruses, such as rhinoviruses and adenoviruses, continue to circulate at low levels among the population, even during the first year of the pandemic. Several non-pharmaceutical interventions, such as mask mandates, led to continued decrease in the burden of these viruses. But surges and smaller clusters or outbreaks did occur when non-pharmaceutical interventions were discontinued. Of course, regional differences of such infections were observed during the time of the pandemic, which were dependent on the respective enforcement or lack thereof for the use of non-pharmaceutical interventions such as masks. <clears throat> that said, <clears throat> let me provide an overview for the reasons why physicians order laboratory tests. Some of the test ordering is certainly influenced by clinical guidelines or the medical necessities as defined by the centers of Medicare, Medicaid services and insurance companies or clinical guidelines um, as published by various societies. There are clinical and technical questions that are to be considered before laboratory tests are ordered. Once a clinician orders a lab test, the process of obtaining laboratory tests and results is divided into three distinct phases, as shown in that image on the right, the pre-analytical, the analytic, and the post-analytic phase of testing. Laboratorians are keenly aware of these phases and how the quality of laboratory tests and their results can be influenced by problems that might occur during any particular point of these three phases, but specifically at the time of specimen procurement or doing the specimen transport. The COVID pandemic had a great influence on the practice of laboratory medicine. To say the least, all of a sudden, many people across the country talked a lot about laboratory testing and people discussed laboratory tests and their performance characteristics on TV, at home, uh, or in many other settings where such discussions would ordinarily not have occurred prior to the pandemic. Please consider briefly how we as laboratorians thought about lab testing prior to the pandemic, and in fact still think about lab testing at the very present time. For example, we view lab tests according to the purpose of their use, to diagnose a disease, to monitor a disease or the treatment efficacy, to screen for a disease or recurrence, and of course we use lab tests in various research and development settings. For laboratory tests, we are concerned about all aspects of quality management and improvement, as well as proficiency testing. Lastly, we consider, uh, of course, guidelines and regulations and standards on lab testing set forth by regulatory agencies. And I highlight these uh, aspects here briefly because I will, um, in the subsequent slides, 
um, on various occasions point out the importance of this, this backbone for laboratory tests. Now, before I go into uh, addressing the impact of COVID <clears throat> on laboratories, I'd like to take a quick step back in history. You may recall the H1N1 influenza pandemic of 2009. On the CDC's website, you can find actually a wonderful summary of all the events. And it is interesting to see how similar certain aspects had been when compared uh, to the events of the COVID-19 pandemic. Of course, now everything is hindsight. Before the H1N1 pandemic, uh, sorry, before the H1N1 influenza pandemic, most testing for respiratory viruses utilized rapid antigen detection testing or DFA in laboratories. Molecular tests were infrequently used since only a few existed at that time. Such tests were more often performed in central core laboratories on high throughput analyzers. Only a few rapid molecular tests for flu and RSV were available or at that time just in development. In 2011, right after the H1N1 pandemic, a working group meeting, including clinical microbiology lab directors convened to discuss the experiences from that pandemic. This expert panel discussed potential future changes in microbiology diagnostics, including the role of uh, future testing technologies, including PCR. This expert group felt that the future of lab testing for respiratory illnesses would be centered on molecular tests rather than the conventional tests such as culture and DFA. They also thought that the role of rapid antigen detection tests would likely be restricted to the ambulatory care setting. Interestingly, several of these issues encountered during the pandemic, the uh, in 2009 influenza pandemic, are very similar to our experiences that we exp uh, had during the COVID pandemic. Several of the expert panel's predictions have become reality during the past 10 years. <clears throat> that said, what were the effects of COVID on the practice of laboratory medicine? Aside from being a center stage for the moment, Laboratories did many things that we never considered doing before the pandemic. Examples include the manufacturing of our own swabs or viral transport media, or providing PCR cycle threshold values for qualitative PCR tests in patient records. Aside from performing testing for diagnostic purposes, many of the laboratories use SARS-CoV-2 testing to screen patients for the, or use the test for general disease surveillance, despite the fact that these lab tests were not approved for such purposes as evident from the respective emergency use authorizations for these tests, rapid and other molecular tests, as well as rapid antigen detection tests were widely used for screening and surveillance. So this slide um, provides a high level overview of lab testing during the pandemic. Most of the testing was essentially focused on pre-symptomatic and symptomatic patients, as well as some asymptomatic patients for the screening purposes, as I mentioned uh, on the previous slide. I will not address the aspects of surveillance testing today, albeit surveillance testing played an important role, especially for the detection of COVID variants and was widely discussed among experts as well as the general population. That said, the three categories of testing available to laboratories include PCR tests, rapid molecular tests, as well as rapid antigen detection tests. The next question that arises then is how to best utilize these different test methods for the purpose of diagnostic testing, screening, and surveillance. <clears throat> Since the initial struggles in healthcare settings and laboratories centered around the issue of available lab tests for COVID, let me emphasize that, the, that it is important to consider the understanding of the disease pathophysiology in all its aspects when selecting the appropriate lab test for diagnosing a specific illness. This is as much true for COVID-19 as it is for any other illness, including the other respiratory viral pathogens. For example, understanding the mode of transmission, the relationship of viral load to the presence of symptoms, and therefore defining infectivity 
has great influence on selecting the best laboratory test for confirming the presence of a, um, the offending pathogen. <clears throat> so during the pandemic, laboratories were challenged to select and implement the most appropriate testing for SARS-CoV-2. In order to provide appropriate service for diagnostic testing, screening patients, as well as surveillance testing. Therefore, most laboratories implemented a mixture of rapid sample to answer tests, high throughput molecular tests, as well as antigen tests. As many of you may remember, use of such tests for purposes of screening and surveillance fell outside the scope of the EUAs. However, such practices were considered acceptable even by the regulatory agencies during the time of the pandemic. Here, I also want to remind everyone that laboratories consider implementation of various tests based on their performance characteristics. Sensitivity and specificity of test methods are such important characteristics. If a sensitivity and specificity are around 50%, then a test, the test performance would be no better than a coin toss and ultimately clinically not very useful. So we were very much focused on selecting the best test so that we're not in this predicament of having a, an inferior test um, that would essentially be just a coin toss. <clears throat> so that said, the traditional molecular assay in form of a real-time single-plex PCR test was therefore the preferred test for diagnosing COVID during the early months of the pandemic. Multiple companies had developed single-plex SARS-CoV-2 assays based on the published primers and probes and the original CDC-developed assay. The initial traditional PCR assay required a complex multi-step workflow process as outlined on the slide. In my own institution, we initially used the Abbott M2000 system for the SARS-CoV-2 EUA testing. Also keep in mind that in the course of the first six months of the pandemic, many companies further developed new and different types of molecular assays utilizing a variety of technologies, such as transcription-mediated amplification, loop-mediated isothermal amplification, and other approaches as listed here on the slide. As mentioned already, during the early months of the pandemic and due to various supply shortages, hospitals and laboratories had to implement a variety of different test methods to keep up with the demand for testing. Furthermore, the shortcomings of rapid antigen detection tests were well known from prior years of use, especially during the time of the 2009 H1 pandemic. Hospitals and laboratories therefore diversified their testing approach according to the specific service areas and needs. Um, I have shown this here in the lower portion of the slide by various um, settings like outpatient and ambulatory, ambulatory care and urgent care centers versus emergency departments and hospital inpatient care. Here you see a summary of the various COVID-19 methods utilized during the pandemic. The review published in the journal Clinics in Laboratory Medicine provides a great overview of these tests and their performance characteristics. Um, details here are beyond the scope of today's talk. The turnaround time of most of these uh, um, tests um, became specifically important, an important measure of test performance that influenced selection of tests uh, for various, uh, in various hospital settings. In general, the turnaround time for most of the molecular tests was, and, and still is, I think, between one and four hours, and therefore clinically reasonably uh, acceptable um, to, for appropriate patient care. <clears throat> so let's take a look at the other illnesses. As I mentioned earlier, and as was mentioned by the uh, previous speaker, influenza cases declined significantly in 2020 during the first fall and winter of the pandemic. Accordingly, laboratory testing for influenza also declined to very low numbers. In fact, I don't really recall doing much of this test of influenza testing in my lab uh, in that first winter of the pandemic. In cases where co-infection was suspected, some combo panel testing was utilized. Such multiplex respiratory 
uh, virus panels already existed prior to the pandemic and included a variety of common respiratory viral and bacterial pathogens. Examples include the Genmark, Eplex, and the BioFire upper respiratory infection panels. During the subsequent months of the pandemic, manufacturers also expanded these test panels uh, for the inclusion of SARS-CoV-2 and often discontinued manufacturing the COVID-19 singleplex cartridges. As for clinical laboratories, that at that point, <clears throat> the question of how to use these multiplex panels arose, specifically considering that in most cases, the focus of testing was still on COVID-19. And only to a much lesser degree was testing for influenza and perhaps RSV requested and performed. At that time, at our own laboratories uh, at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center, we utilized the Abbott M2000 analyzers as well as the Alinity M analyzer for the COVID testing. As soon as the respiratory fourplex emergency use authorization test for the Alinity M analyzer became available, we evaluated and then sub subsequently implemented this assay for testing. We published the experience with this assay in the journal Diagnostic Microbiology and in Infectious Diseases. This assay tests for SARS-CoV-2, influenza A and B, and RSV. The details uh, for the primers and probes are listed here on the slide. Considering that we had seen at that point a re-emergence of influenza um, compared to the earlier time in the pandemic, and considering that it is difficult to differentiate these three illnesses on clinical symptoms alone, the use of the multiplex assay seemed appropriate for implementation in our laboratory. <clears throat> on this next slide, um, I want to provide an overview of the results and conclusions um, for, of this initial study that we conducted. We used um, the, all the testing, um, for all the testing we used um, uh, previously tested and stored uh, specimens uh, from our laboratory. Um, in summary, we found that the results for COVID-19 testing using the RESP 4 plex EUA assay on the Alinity M analyzer highly correlated with the test results from the previously established methods of testing. In addition, we had 100% correlation of test results for both influenza and RSV for the RESP 4 plex EUA assay compared to the samples tested previously on other established uh, and approved test methods. This assay, uh, in our view, is a welcomed addition to the targeted respiratory panel options in the post-pandemic world as well. It allows for high throughput testing with sample to answer testing characteristics and a very reasonable short turnaround time for results reporting. In addition, the Alinity M analyzer affords laboratories to run other assays in parallel as re reagents for various assays like HIV or hepatitis, for example, can be uh, on board of the analyzer. And lastly, one of the features um, that um, is, is also quite useful is the random access and semi-batch functionality um, that, uh, that the um, uh, Alinity M uh, has. <clears throat> so here, I would like to briefly review the experience uh, with some data that I want to show you uh, using uh, various assays. So we start with the singleplex SARS-CoV-2 assay, and then I want to look at the uh, RESP 4-plex EUA assay. First note that overall volume for SARS-CoV-2 testing during all years of the pandemic um, is, has been uh, significantly high. We, we had a high throughput of testing. Um, and then we began using the RESP 4 plex assay in 2021. And the number of samples tested increased in the second year and then subsequently. I anticipate that test numbers for 2023 continue to increase as we will enter this year's flu season. <clears throat> During the height of the pandemic, we as many laboratories provided COVID testing on a 24-7 basis with three shifts of testing performed on three shifts per day usually. The initial test method used in our lab required batch mode testing, and we typically had one test run per shift. Random access testing as needed, depending on the clinical situation, was performed using um, one of the other test platforms, as I had mentioned those earlier. 
after implementing the REST fourplex EUA assay, we continued performing testing every day. At the present time, however, we only provide testing on day and evening shift. Numbers uh, and, and cases have, have dropped and we adjusted accordingly. If rapid testing is needed at the moment, especially during the overnight shift time, we utilize other rapid sample to answer test methods. However, depending on the epidemiologic situation during the fall and winter, the workflow in our laboratory may change yet again. Implementing the REST fourplex assay on the Alinity M analyzer significantly shortened the turnaround time for results for SARS-CoV-2 and other respiratory viruses compared to the earlier times in the pandemic. <clears throat> During the past two decades, molecular tests have emerged as a cornerstone of the diagnosis of infectious diseases as their performance characteristics are significantly better than those of traditional test methods such as rapid antigen detection tests, culture-based methods, and DFA. Improved workflow in the laboratory and reduction of turnaround time are other benefits of molecular assays compared to viral culture and DFA. Furthermore, for several years now, Many um, of the test platforms afforded laboratories the opportunity to use multiplex testing for various clinical syndromes. The utility of respiratory multiplex testing, specifically focusing on COVID influenza and RSV, has been proven to be of clinical utility in various healthcare settings, and especially for immunosuppressed patients. However, one drawback of pre-constructed multiplex panels using cartridge-based testing has been that such panels are not easily adjustable to emerging novel pathogens, especially during the time of a pandemic. <clears throat> so multiplex testing in general, as I mentioned, and as shown here on the slide, shows benefits for various clinical settings and usually has reasonably short turnaround times for results. Using multiplex tests on high throughput analyzers has certain additional advantages. In my opinion, the ability to use different assays on one analyzer platform that also provides random access as well as semi-batch functionality pro <clears throat> provides further advantages to laboratories with regard to workflow management. On the other hand, one of the cartridge-based multiplex test panels that have now received clear wave status and are therefore amenable to use in urgent care and point of care settings is also a very, very beneficial consideration for laboratories. Lastly, considering the current state of COVID-19, influenza and RSV, largely based on last year's experience, I think that year-round testing for all three viruses with a multiplex assay will provide for better surveillance and a, a, will provide valuable insight for potential surges of these illnesses in the upcoming winter flu season. <clears throat> that said, during the upcoming post-pandemic years, laboratory testing for respiratory viral pathogens will continue to depend on the clinical needs in specific healthcare settings. Since hospitals have now streamlined and simplified the approach to lab testing for COVID and other respiratory viral pathogens, the use of a multiplex assay focusing on the three most common viral pathogens, namely SARS-CoV-2, influenza and RSV, depends, in my opinion, on three key questions. How will test results change the approach to treatment? Is there a risk for co-infections or bacterial superinfections? Dr. Wolf had previously alluded to the clinical consequences and morbidity of SARS-CoV-2 and influenza co-infections. Lastly, one might want to ask the question of whether there is a risk of spreading of any of these three pathogens among specifically vulnerable patient populations within hospitals or within other specific healthcare settings like long-term care facilities. The use of a multiplex or fourplex assay could therefore provide great support for hospital epidemiology and infection control departments and efforts. <clears throat> Coming back to the pandemic, the federal public health emergency for COVID-19 had ended earlier this year in May. While we are all probably feel very grateful at this point, please remember that SARS-CoV-2 is still going to be around. <clears throat> 
At this point in time, most cases present with milder forms of the illness due to the currently circulating virus variants and the fact that a large portion of the population has some form of immunity due to vaccination or perhaps prior illness. However, it is reasonable to expect SARS-CoV-2 to remain a pathogen of clinical significance and new variants may continue to emerge. Testing for SARS-CoV-2 will remain an important cornerstone in all clinical practice and therefore the currently existing EUAs for lab tests as well as for vaccines and treatments will remain in place. While several practices implemented during the pandemic will stop or have stopped already, others will remain in place for the time being but I do anticipate that there will be continuous adjustments of all of these practices and guidelines in the coming months. <clears throat> Lastly, I would like to briefly mention a concept of at-home testing. Implemented during the pandemic for detection of SARS-CoV-2 with the intent to improve implementation and practice of the isolation and quarantine guidelines, the FDA approved of a combination COVID-19 and influenza home test earlier this year. The benefits of such home testing are clear. However, there are certain challenges, especially when test results appear to be indeterminate. The faint line on a rapid antigen detection test card can be confusing to patients. As much as it is perhaps uh, confusing to healthcare providers or to laboratorians. Furthermore, there are currently no clear guidelines on how to follow up on positive test results. Additionally, the inability to capture these at-home test results for epidemiologic purposes, especially when patients may only have mild disease and stay at home until recovery, might prove problematic when trying to assess the exact epidemiology of either one of these two illnesses in the future. There are certainly future needs and opportunities as well for home testing. Uh, for example, the use of AI for data capture or the integration of at-home testing across different healthcare settings. <clears throat> Nearing the conclusion of my portion of today's presentation, I think that it is reasonable to expect that transmission of influenza and RSV will return to levels seen prior to the COVID pandemic. SARS-CoV-2 will also remain as a major pathogen in the coming months but is more likely to cause regional outbreaks and perhaps many waves rather than following a seasonal pattern at this point. It is also reasonable to expect that co-infections with these three pathogens will occur and therefore laboratory testing for upper respiratory viral illnesses should include detection of SARS-CoV-2, influenza A and B and RSV across a larger section of patient populations but certainly in vulnerable patient populations as listed on the slide here. Use of high throughput sample to answer test methods with reasonably fast turnaround times in hospital based laboratories will therefore be desired. So in conclusion, I'd like to remind the audience that the landscape of upper respiratory infections will continue to evolve, predicting this exact epidemiologic course of illnesses will be challenging at this very moment. Therefore, the use of molecular multiplex assays to detect the major pathogens, namely SARS-CoV-2, influenza A, B, and RSV, we will prove to be very beneficial to hospitals across the country for immediate patient care as well as hospital, epi, and infection control purposes. Other molecular tests as well as rapid antigen detection tests will certainly remain in the mix of test methods and will remain to be useful in select and specific patient care settings as well. With that, I'd like to thank you for your attention and we are now able to take any questions that you may have. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wolf and Dr. Riedel for your informative presentations. We will now start the live Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have a question you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just type your question in the Ask a Question box and click Submit. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for today. Uh, let's go ahead and get started. Our first question that we have here, it looks like is for Dr. Wolf. 
with vaccines for all three viruses available, how do you foresee the, year, the implementation during this flu season? Do you think we will continue to have a recommendation to receive COVID vaccine or a booster with the flu vaccine? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, I think it's, on the one hand, it's great that we have three available vaccines. Um, on the other hand, it's a logistic headache, to be frank, for most clinicians to think about how they're gonna navigate those for their patients. You know, the way I'm describing it to most folks is I think the clinical disease remains more severe probably for flu and COVID. And we actually have the greatest amount of data on the co-administration of those vaccines. So to me, the priority for almost all of the patients I see, and admittedly, I see an older and immunosuppressed group of individuals is to jointly administer, if they're willing, um, the, uh, the impending XBB variant COVID vaccine along with a high dose flu shot. Uh, and wait a little bit of time before RSV. Uh, you know, that's that's not especially data-driven, but it reflects the fact that there is no data that I'm aware of of the co-administration of all three. Um, and I, th I think that's probably, uh, you know, for most people more than what they more than what they need. You know, the the, the logistics is also a little more tricky because RSV vaccines, at least um, from a billing point of view, if you're over 65, need to be done through private pharmacies, not hospital institutions. It's different if you're 60 to 64. Uh, so, there'll, so there'll be some challenges, I think, rolling those out. Um, and so I, I've really encouraged most folks, clinicians here, to focus principally on COVID updates and flu vaccines and RSV sort of a second, uh, second notch down, maybe two to three weeks after you gave the other two. Yeah, I, clearly, each individual center is going to have to grapple with that as a logistic effort. It's, it's not straightforward. Down the road, we hope to actually fuse those vaccines into one needle. Um, that has appeal, I think, because it's just logistically easy to give people their sort of their winter respiratory viral vaccine. Um, but we're a year or two at least away from that taking place. Great, thank you. All right, here. It looks like our next question here is for Dr. Riedel. Uh, for some countries like Iran, where there is no pills for influenza, is there any point to get costly tests like RT-PCR? Uh, well, this this is actually a, a great question for, for testing uh, itself. So um, I, I think that PCR testing in general should probably be, whether it's rapid or um, or on a high throughput analyzer in a centralized lab is certainly beneficial over the antigen testing. Um, I, I just want to make sure I understand the question correctly, aiming at the availability of uh, testing. I mean, cost varies by, by assay and some of these rapid and um, uh, molecular tests that are cartridge based can actually be quite costly. Um, now that we're back to kind of the regular process of laboratory testing. Um, so, you know, again, I think it's, um, it, it's important to, to diagnose a disease, particularly in vulnerable populations or in those that are, you know, immunosuppressed where actually treatment and intervention is, is important. So, um, Again, to my knowledge, uh, I think most of the influenza testing is really widely available in, in, in various types of tests uh, across the globe. If, if I can riff off the back of that, I, I think there was a part of, maybe part of the question also was hinting at what if you don't have any treatments on the back end. Um, I think that's an important consideration because, you know, for the, you, what are you going to do with that answer that comes out of the lab test is, is really crucial. And to me, it's not just treatment. Treatment clearly needs to be focused more on at-risk people, as you mentioned, uh, Dr. Bell. But I'm always, always interested in who else is at the home. Like, am I going to potentially reduce the impact of transmission to other family members or nursing home members if I know someone actually has influenza, even if I don't have a treatment in front of them that's going to be impactful? I, I think there's infection prevention reasons there that can be uh, strategically useful as well. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Excellent point. Thank you for, for adding that. That's, that's great. Great. Uh, it looks like we have another question here. It's for both of you. Uh, would rapid antigen tests for RSV, flu, um, 
AB and SARS-CoV-2 be recommended for patients over 60 years with cold symptoms in POC settings? So this is this is an excellent question. Uh, so as as I mentioned on my slides, we we during the pandemic, we as laboratories, uh, as hospitals, urgent care centers, you name it, uh, the the biggest challenge was you know do I have enough testing capacity? Whether it's for flu or RSV or COVID, right? So a lot of tests were brought on, and then. Um, many places made these strategic decisions on what tests do I use in what type of setting. So urgent care centers or the point of care, POC point of care, testing environment obviously is amenable to, you know, utilizing a test with a very fast turnaround time. So swap and then an antigen test, like that you have the answer in about 10 minutes. Now that <clears throat> In, in the peak, and we've, that's what I mentioned in my talk, in the peak of a season, we know these tests perform reasonably well. And then, of course, during the pandemic, particularly for COVID, we use those tests to also screen or look at infectivity or retest. And then there were the home tests that became available. So I, I think in addition to these antigen tests, um, we do have uh, rapid molecular tests and, and that they're still coming uh, to the market. Uh, various companies produce those, whether they're single plex or some are multiplex or, or take these uh, combo cartridge based that are now wave, particularly aiming at point of care testing. I think it's going to be important. Rapid antigen tests certainly in the mix. And I think it's a financial question too, in, in what type of setting, whether it's a physician's practice or if it's truly a larger urgent care center or a network uh, situation. Uh, so it's it's really difficult to say. I mean, it, it, to, from my perspective, yes, antigen tests certainly will, won't disappear. Um, they are, have utility, they're useful, and, and I think it would depend on the individual provider. I don't know, Dr. Wolf, if you think, as from a clinical perspective, what you prefer in certain settings and how you would utilize them. No, I, I think your answer is spot on, to be honest. I mean, I, my sort of sense is that I lean more towards molecular testing and perhaps uh, an ever so slightly increased um, accuracy, I guess, for want of a better word, the more sick the person mm -hmm. is. So I think the, the question was well framed that in a point of care setting, where presumably for outpatient management for urgent care settings, you know, maybe timing of answer is perhaps more important than that last little tiny piece of, of, of sensitivity or specificity. Whereas I think I would flip that the other way and say, if I'm looking at a patient who's already in the hospital, heaven forbid, already in the intensive care, I, you know, I need the most accurate test in front of me. I actually have a little bit of time there. So that, that, that would flip more towards a molecular assessment. So. So it varies. I think there's distinctly a role for both. Yeah. Okay, perfect. So it looks like our next question that we have here is for Dr. Riedel. Um, let's see. The time, uh, hold on, sorry. <laughs> the time to result to patient, especially in an outpatient or home-based setting can be extended and impractical for rapid treatment or action. I agree with Dr. Riedel on the value of POC and home-based molecular testing. Can Dr. Riedel please expand on this perspective of POC and home-based multiplex molecular tests, their expanded use and value in the full diagnostic and screening continuum to augment lab-based testing? Thank you. Uh, this is this is actually a, a, an excellent question. And uh, the home-based testing, let me start with this. So I, I think... Um, as, as we already mentioned, using a rapid molecular test in an urgent care setting, I think certainly has benefit. Uh, the patient is, is right there and, and treatment can be implemented. And if we adding maybe 10 minutes wait time for that test, that's okay. But the at home test certainly had shown quite a bit of an advantage during the um, uh, COVID pandemic, because uh, as you know, many people are worried and, um, and these tests became available. And they could test at home. They didn't have to actually, with if they had indeed COVID, they didn't have to go outside. Uh, speaking to what Dr. Wolf mentioned before, we're, we're, we're basically transmitting disease. You know, to whom are we then spreading this disease? If we can do this at home, 
and simply say, well, I don't, I, I'm sick, but I'm, I'm kind of okay, and I can stay at home, manage this myself, uh, they, you know, then maybe um, I pick up the phone, or we have now these um, more sophisticated ways of communicating with, with physicians via those patient sites and can send a quick message to my doctor and say, look, I did a home test, it's positive, what should I do? I think that is becomes much more manageable. And with the fact that the FDA cleared also a flu test for this, I think depending on disease severity, I think this this gives an opportunity to uh, to develop new ways of managing um, the milder disease in uh, otherwise healthy patients or fairly healthy patients who don't need to then come to the uh, hospital for care, and I believe, as a physician, Dr. Wolf, correct me if I'm wrong, but you could actually prescribe and then tell the patient you can pick up Tamiflu or so at the pharmacy. You don't need to come in unless X, Y, Z things worsen, and and uh, that is that is a guidance. So I think, I think looking at the future, um, there will be based on this this COVID experience. Um, there will be probably changes in how we utilize those types of tests and, and strategize and get patients into the appropriate uh, care and, and avoid having them always come to an urgent care or an emergency department um, and um, clog those lines of, you know, with other patients or spread the illness. I 100% agree. This is going to be a really interesting strategic opportunity to turn management on its head and we, we've grappled already with that question for a lot of our transplant or chemotherapy based patients where we know they're at risk at home um, they have some level of respiratory infection but clinically they're not so severe as to need to come in you know traditionally we would bring that person in we would say hey i'm, I'm really worried about you because of your high risk status come into an urgent care or an ed and we'll get some testing and in fact even if they didn't have covid or flu my ED or urgent care probably had more of it and increased their risk by merely getting the test. So now we can flip it on the flip it the other way around and say, you know, you may have the opportunity to test yourself at home. If you get a positive, then then we'll chat and we'll stratify your symptoms based on that test result, understand what the positive predictive value of that is, and then we can actually make some real strategic decisions. Are you well enough that we give you COVID or flu management at the moment? Are you unwell enough that, like, here's your algorithm to actually come into the hospital and we'll manage you more acutely? You know, we couldn't do that three years ago. Um, we sort of learned algorithms of how to do that during COVID, and um, we have telephone banks of good clinicians already set up that help a lot of our outpatients sort of strategize that for COVID. And I, I see a future where that's sort of dovetailed with other respiratory viruses that they can now test at home as well. I think it'll be a really positive thing for the patients. Wonderful. Uh, thank you. It looks like that is all the time that we have for questions during this live portion of the webinar. Um, I did want to ask Dr. Wolf and Dr. Riedel, do you, either of you have any final comments for our audience that joined us here today? Do you want to, do you want to go first, sir, or I can, by the way? <laughs> <laughs> um, let's have uh, um, Dr. Yeah. Riedel go ahead and go first. No, I, I, you know, I have, don't have any additional comments. So thank you, thank you for the opportunity. I think uh, the um, we'll, we'll continue to see an evolution of strategies and technologies. And uh, you know, I, I, I only see that what we learn from this pandemic again will propel molecular diagnostics forward, will simplify uh, tests, um, be more, uh, bring testing closer to. Uh, to the patient and, uh, you know, with telemedicine afford us a lot of opportunities to manage uh, patients in, in a lot better way. Yeah, I'd, I'd reiterate the same thing. I think we've got a lot of lessons that we can pull out of the last three years that will not only help us manage patients better, but maybe also on a community-wide basis reflect that we should all um, be respectful of these respiratory viruses as they turn up and be respectful of each other with good... With good uh, viral hygiene, probably stuff that we should have been doing for many, many years prior to the pandemic, but it has put it front and center of our minds. So I appreciate the chance to talk as well. Okay. Thank you uh, both again for your time today and for your important research. We would like to thank LabRoots and our sponsor Abbott for underwriting today's educational webcast. Before we go, I'd like to thank the audience for joining us today and for their interesting questions questions that we did not have time for today and any questions submitted during the on-demand period 
will be addressed by our speakers via the contact information you provided at the time of registration. This webcast can be viewed on demand. LabRoots will alert you via email when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Until next time, take care and goodbye.